rise. <clears throat> Let us pray. Almighty God, graciously behold this your family for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and delivered into the hands of sinful men to suffer death upon the cross. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. Our Old Testament reading from Isaiah, beginning in the 52nd chapter. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up. He shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what they heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death and was numbered to the, with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Merciful and everlasting God, you did not spare your only Son, but delivered him up for us all to bear our sins on the cross. Grant that our hearts may be so fixed with steadfast faith in him that we fear not the power of sin, death, and the devil, through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our epistle reading is from 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. 
The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and has entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you will that your Son should bear for us the pains of the cross and so remove from us the power of the adversary. Help us so to remember and give thanks for our Lord's passion that we may receive forgiveness of sins and redemption from everlasting death through Jesus Christ our Lord. <clears throat> Gospel reading, beginning in the 18th chapter of St. John. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley. There was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all things that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing there. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Out of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. 
So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once the rooster crowed. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside and said to them, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at Passover. So you do want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber.
Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, you, Will you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement and an Aramaic Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross to a place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things.
Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear And at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again another scripture says they will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things Joseph of Arimathea who was a disciple of Jesus but secretly for fear of the Jews asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloe, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there.
grace and peace in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our text is from the epistle reading, verse 15. He died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Dear fellow redeemed, as St. Paul ministered to the very troubled congregation in Corinth, he spoke to them about Jesus' suffering and death. And he tried to help them understand what the suffering and death of Jesus meant for them in their lives. Paul didn't dwell on the graphic details of Jesus' torturous death. John in his gospel that we read through, he lays out before us the whole horror of what Christ endured that we might be reminded how much our Savior was willing to face for us. And we can assume that the congregation there in Corinth knew well the story of Jesus' crucifixion, as well as we do at least, if not better. Instead of blood and gore, Paul talked to them about the impact of Jesus' death on their lives. See, Jesus changes the trajectory of a sinful life. He directs us away from ourselves and gives us a whole new point and purpose in life. Paul explained it to them. He died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Jesus' crucifixion does not change us in the sense of just pointing out what he endured and saying to us, look what he went through, now what are you going to do to show him how much you appreciate it? Changing hearts by the law like that never works. and God isn't concerned with just changing our outward behavior. Jesus' death changes us in the sense that there is something in us that died when he died. And that's what St. Paul told the Corinthians. He said, we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. There is a darkness that's inside us from birth. There's a heart and there's a mind that by nature seems directed away from God and his ways. We fight God's will by nature. We look for loopholes and ways around it. We seek ourselves. So at our core is this opposition to the love of God and to the obedience of God. We have a heart actively trying to damn us, it seems. But that is what Jesus carried to his cross. That is what he put to death. We all died in his crucifixion. That part of us that lives to be in rebellion against the holiness of God, died in Christ's death. And because he killed that controlling part of our heart, we can now live in him. We have a new life. We have life to receive his grace, to believe his word, to follow his will, not out of a sense of having to, but out of a sense of, of this now finally being possible for us. Because that controlling power of wickedness that lived within us doesn't control us anymore. It died in Christ. Now consider the people to whom Paul first taught this, the Corinthians. They were a people who had a real problem understanding how the death of Christ impacted their real daily lives. The members of that congregation had fallen into some horrific sins, gross sexual sins like incest. They had turned a blind eye to each other's perversion. They were bragging that they were better than the next guy. They were careless in their faith, making weaker brothers and sisters stumble in their faith. A whole laundry list of terrible, unchristian, even demonic things that all seemed to suggest that Jesus' suffering and death meant nothing to them. So Paul had to remind them 
of what his death meant. That it meant the death of that evil that was, a, that was controlling them, that they were allowing to control them. So Paul tells them, if anybody is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It was a much needed reminder. That old thing within them, that old evil controlling nature had died. And now they were remade as new creations in a new image. They bore the image of the Son of God who lived and died in their place. They bore the image of the one who served God by yielding up his very life. And that one's death meant the death of their old sinful self. It meant they were now free to live in Christ's grace. There's five times in this short reading that we had that Paul uses the word reconciliation. He says, we plead with you to be reconciled to God. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and he has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. To reconcile means to change. It is the one who is at odds with the other changes to become more in line with what is right. So Paul is explaining how the suffering and death of Jesus is meant to cause change in us. It has a real, practical application to each one of us. His crucifixion is a power for change within us. And if people ignore that power to change and continue to live like the rest of the world around them as if they have no Savior, then his suffering and death will mean nothing to them. This evening, as we look to the cross of Christ, we see in him a new life being born in us we see the death of that inner power of evil that seeks to control us. We see his righteousness being taken from him and credited to us. So that our religion isn't just religious talk when we get together, but it becomes a new life we live every moment of the day. Paul describes this as us becoming the righteousness of God in him. So his righteousness, given to us, stamped on our lives so that we might live it out. And the thing is, this, this righteousness won for us on the cross is a righteousness Christ keeps giving to us. He is patient and merciful and he keeps heaping it on us again and again, week after week, in the grace and forgiveness he gives right here at the grace he gives at his supper, at the forgiveness he speaks into us when we hear his absolution. Every week we die to sin and have his life put back into us. So practically speaking, as Paul explains to the Corinthians and to us, the crucifixion of Jesus means that he is continually changing us, putting down our old sinful self and creating his righteousness anew within us once more. Now we are a people who live in God's Holy Spirit, who live to be made clean by his forgiveness. And we live to point the world around us to this Savior and what he has done because it is his will that all people be included in his gifts of grace and righteousness. Everything about us has changed because of what Jesus has done for us on his cross. You are a people now dead to sin. You are a people now alive in his grace and righteousness. Thanks be to Jesus. Amen.
Now may the peace that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. This evening, for the prayer of the church, we pray a prayer called the bidding prayer. At the end of each petition, the congregation responds with amen. So let us pray for the whole Christian church that our Lord God would defend her against all the assaults and temptations of the adversary and keep her perpetually on the true foundation of Jesus Christ. Almighty and everlasting God, since you have revealed your glory to all nations in Jesus Christ and in the word of his truth, Keep, we ask you, in safety the works of your mercy, so that your church, spread throughout all the nations, may de be defended against the adversary and may serve you in true faith and persevere in the confession of your name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all the ministers of the word and for all vocations in the church and for all the people of God. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is governed and sanctified, receive the supplications and prayers which we offer you for all your servants in your holy church and for every member of the same, that we may together serve you according to our calling through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray, our Lord God Almighty, that he would deliver the world from all error take away disease, ward off famine, set free those in bondage, and grant health to the sick and safe journeys to all who travel. Almighty God, the consolation of the sorrowful and the strength of the weak, may the prayers of those who in any tribulation or distress cry to you graciously come before you, so that in all their necessities they may rejoice in your manifold help and comfort, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who are outside the church, that our Lord God would be pleased to deliver them from their error, call them to faith in the true and living God and his only Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and gather them into the family of his church. Almighty and everlasting God, because you seek not the death but the life of all, Hear our prayers for all who have no right knowledge of you. Free them from their error. And for the glory of your name, bring them into the fellowship of your holy church through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for peace, that we may come to the knowledge of God's holy word and walk before him as is fitting for Christians. Almighty and everlasting God, King of glory and Lord of heaven and earth, by whose spirit all things are governed and by whose providence all things are ordered, the God of peace and the author of all concord, grant us, we implore you, your heavenly peace and concord, that we may serve you in true fear to the praise and glory of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for our enemies, that God would remember them in mercy and graciously grant them such things as are both needful for them and profitable for their salvation. O almighty, everlasting God, through your only Son, our blessed Lord, you have commanded us to love our enemies, to do good to those who hate us, and to pray for all those who persecute us. We therefore earnestly implore you that by your gracious visitation, all our enemies may be led to true repentance and may have the same love and be of one accord and one mind and heart with us and with your whole Christian church on earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And finally, let us pray for the fruits of the earth, that God would send down his blessings upon them and graciously dispose our hearts to enjoy them according to his good will. O Lord, Father Almighty, by your word you create, and you continue to bless and uphold all things. We pray you so to reveal to us your word, our Lord Jesus Christ, that through his dwelling in our hearts, we may, by your grace,
be made ready to receive your blessings on all the fruits of the earth and whatsoever pertains to our bodily needs through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We continue with the reproaches. Thus says the Lord, What have I done to you, O my people, and wherein have I offended you? Answer me. For I have raised you up out of the prison house of sin and death, and you have delivered up your Redeemer to be scourged. For I have redeemed you from the house of bondage, and you have nailed your Savior to the cross, O my people. What have I done to you, O my people, and wherein have I offended you? Answer me. For I have conquered all your foes, and you have given me over and delivered me to those who persecute me. For I have fed you with my word and refreshed you with my living water, and you have given me gall and vinegar to drink, O my people. Thus says the Lord, what have I done to you, O my people, and wherein have I offended you? Answer me. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? My people, is this how you thank your God, O my people?
Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who accomplished the salvation of mankind by the tree of the cross, that where death arose, their life also might rise again, and that the serpent who overcame by the, death of the, by the tree of the garden may likewise by the tree of the cross be overcome. Hear us as we pray in, in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
We implore you, O Lord, that your abundant blessing may be upon your people who have held the passion and death of your Son in devout remembrance, that we may receive your pardon and the gift of your comfort and may increase in faith and take hold of eternal salvation. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.